Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and health practice leader at Retzel and Andrus. And today I'm joined by Kate Otis. Kate is the founder and president of Data DX and the president of Health Professionals Alliance. And today we're going to be talking about a really important topic to me, which is independent physicians and independent practices. And this is something that I know Kate and I have talked about as something that she's very passionate about. And so I'm really excited to hear from Kate and have all of you hear about her involvement uh, with private practices and, and why she's so committed to them. So welcome, Kate. And uh, why don't we start by having you just tell us a little bit about what you do, who you are, and why you're passionate about independent practices. Sure, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So with private practice, that's where I've spent the majority of my career, let's say the first half. I was working directly with doctors side by side, helping them lead their practices and primarily in specialty groups. So surgical groups by and large, um, plastic surgery, dermatology, orthopedics, and then other groups as I transitioned into consulting. Um, it's, it's really fun to actually transition to consulting because when you go from being an employee to a, to a consultant, doctors actually listen more to you. <laughs> so that was, that was a fun transition. And, and you know, working side by side with physicians presented a lot of opportunities to help look at strategies to grow and ways to build sustainable solutions inside of their practices. They need to focus on seeing patients and providing quality care. And I was able to help work with the teams on building efficient operations, good clinical procedures, as far as what the staff needed to do to help the doctors. Um, and one of our goals was, you know, depending on the building we were in, but um, if the patient has to get in the elevator, once those doors close, they remember what the doctor told them to do or what that treatment plan was. And if they didn't, then we didn't look at that as a success. Um, transitioning into Health Professionals Alliance and Data DX, you know, Data DX was created from years spent working with doctors in their practices and trying to develop good financial reports in real time, which was nearly impossible. All the systems are siloed and you know, the billing offices have to close, the cash has to be reconciled and our administrative teams are small typically and very savvy in certain areas, but usually resource constrained. And so you know, you're on financials working 45, 60, sometimes 90 days you know, in the past. And so if you're trying to understand key drivers in the business that becomes incredibly challenging. Furthermore, if you're working in Excel, you're subject to making a mistake, not on purpose, but it just happens. Numbers get mis you know, composed. And so Data DX was born from the idea that there has to be a better way to produce financials for physicians in real time and help them understand the drivers so that they can make meaningful changes and pivots in the business when needed um, to help prevent issues, challenges, pitfalls, what have you, um, cash flow issues, see revenue cycle problems, optimization, and even utilization of facilities because they're, off, they're sometimes not really looking at how are we leveraging our exam rooms? Do we have the volume to sustain our healthy overhead or you know, are we taking a little bit too much time off or spending too much time with one type of patient and not enough time with another? And so giving them meaningful data helps them understand how to better organize their businesses. Health Professionals Alliance is born to help physicians. It's an alternative essentially to private equity and hospital-based employment arrangements. And the idea behind Health Professionals Alliance was actually born from conversations with physicians, in particular, a group of physicians that had just entered into a private equity deal and became very frustrated, angry almost with the deal that they had just signed about 12 to 16 months after the deal was executed. They felt like they were sold a bill of goods and um, the, the promises weren't met. The profits didn't improve. Um, the impact on the clinical side of the practice was more than what it said that it would be. Um, typically, when you experience a private equity deal, the transaction is supposed to be on the non-clinical assets and supposed to leave the clinical care out of the out of the deal, out of the operational management and control. Um, there's usually a tax or overhead fee that's paid for some type of management services, you know, billing and marketing and whatnot. And clinical care is supposed to be left to the doctors. 
But what usually happens is because the goals of some of these organizations are to improve margins by 20 to 30 percent, well, that means they need to see more volume. So that definitely impacts their schedules and their clinical time, but also sometimes it impacts the codes that they have to use. And so these two organizations were born to help fuel private practice bring more profitability resources and solutions that are, are an alternative. So Data DX and Health Professionals Alliance work together. The Data DX sits up at the core as a technology enabled solution to bring those business insights to the practice. And HPA is a membership organization essentially that fuels them with the services. So, sorry, okay. long-winded answer. Really interesting. And I know what you're talking about with private equity deals. You know, we handle a lot of these. And I think the doctors go in very excited with a lot of the promises that are being made. And uh, I think it's no surprise that sometimes things don't work out as planned because, um, you know, they're in it for different reasons. A lot of times physicians are in it to serve their patients, to serve the community, to grow, um, you know, uh, research, development, whatever it is they do in their practice. And private equity is really in it for profit and, right. you know, and maybe to grow and sell, right? So sometimes there's a little bit of a, a conflict between their goals. Um, and I do think a lot of my doctors enter into private equity deals because they feel there's no other choice that that's where things are headed, or maybe a hospital hasn't been interested in acquiring them, or they feel like they can't compete anymore with you know some of the bigger groups or private equity owned groups in their neighborhood, right? So right. Um, you know often they they don't want to and they're nervous, but they feel they have no choice but to do that. So I guess what I'm curious about is if I'm an independent practice and I am trying to stay alive and stay independent you have talked about two different components that you work with practices on. And one is the technical side. So let's start with that. So if we're on the technical side of things and, and we use something like Data DX, the idea is that before where we didn't know what was going on or where we didn't have the capability to run certain types of reports or we had to rely or didn't want to spend the money on outside consultants to give us that information, now we can do it ourselves. Is that kind of the idea? That is the idea, exactly. The, the tool essentially, it's AI driven and based. And so after the data is pulled into the tool, there's predictive analysis that are applied ac across their, uh, their data and helps them see what the trends have been, where they might be changing, and provides recommendations to alternative plans that they might take. Um, at the core of the platform, we have a team of consultants that's also watching these trends and working with the data engineering team to make sure that the recommendations that are produced through the AI are meaningful and what you're actually seeing with inside healthcare practices. Um, so there's, there's a nice human element to where, where we're trying to be very scalable and, and use our technology wisely. We also have right. that human element that's bringing the business acumen and experience to those reports or, or to the recommendations fueled through the tool. So when you see that data and then you go to the practice or the practice gets a recommendation about changes they can make, improvements they can make, and then do they usually go ahead and implement and do you measure those types of improvements? And what would be some good examples of some types of recommendations or improvements that are made? That's a great question. There's several different areas. There's four, four common areas that we work within. Contracting is one. So there's a lot of rate modeling that we can provide by analyzing the contracts that they have and the procedure codes of payments that come in currently through the payers. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lack of optimization of those contracts and understanding if they're even getting paid on a contractual basis. And while it is becoming harder and harder to negotiate with the health plan, it is still possible. And so it's really important to bring good data to those conversations and again, understand what the fee proposed changes might be and the impact. So that's one, one big deliverable through the tool. Um, we see, have seen this year actually rate increases of around 5% in certain areas in the country, which you know, we haven't been able to say that for a while. 3% or 2% was actually pretty average for several years. Um, we work with people like you, of course, to do the provision reviews and, and whatnot. Um, credentialing, provider credentialing is something that actually the tool helps benefit the practice within. Um, there are commonly credentialing issues that delay billing. And so we'll point the practice into that area. And we also offer credentialing through the tool as well. Um, 
growth initiatives. So understanding the patient population that the practice is serving and what areas for growth there might be. So this could be through like a zip code analysis and a heat map, understanding where the patients are that are coming to your practice. Potentially also understanding your refer referring physicians and any referral pattern changes and making sure that they're nurturing those relationships. And again, layering that heat zone or heat map over the top to make sure that they understand, you know, any new, new trends or, um, or changes because a, a referring physician is very important. They usually have 10 that they rely on to, to bring in patients to their practice. All right. So I guess, you know, what then, so if we're talking to a practice and we say, here's the technology piece with the support and everything that we can bring yeah. to you. Um, and then we pair it again with the other services that you're providing, uh, which right. you describe more as, um, you know, kind of a, it's a network or um, how, what, how, I'm trying to think of the words that you use to describe it. Um, what are the kinds of things that, that they get by participating in that that helps support their practice? Like, why would they want to be part of that? That's a great question. So it's resource driven, essentially. So what are the resources that the practice needs? There's no mandates. They can choose. There's a menu of resources that they might need. So some of the practices are going to have a really great marketing provider. Others are not, as an example. Um, some may need recommendations for a different EMR system. They're unhappy with that or need revenue cycle optimization. So code reviews, as I mentioned before. IT and HIPAA compliance of another vendor that does that for our clients. So essentially when a practice joins our alliance, we will do a practice assessment and help them identify basically quick wins that will help with either top or bottom line improvements within the practice. So, you know, we have currently 20 different basically healthcare businesses that are service providers to medical practices. And we have about 30 more businesses that we'll be bringing on as strategic partners over the next quarter. So that way the physicians and, and dentists essentially, because we have both within our network can pick and choose what's best, or they can ask us to help them with that. It kind of depends on their infrastructure and resources. So we try to augment and then help drive improvement and We'll walk our clients through kind of a phased approach so it's not overwhelming because obviously we're asking them to make changes, which is already hard. I mean, we don't drive banking changes or things like that because that's, that's a very onerous exercise for the practice. Although we may recommend a merchant change because we have a better fee with the merchant service provider. Um, so those are some real small examples, but they can drive immediate improvements and, you know, bottom line improvement is great. And where revenue strategies are, are there to, to tweak, then we can help practices with that as well. Everything so are, we like to look at like growth-based. So these are really ways that if an independent practice is struggling, uh, they don't have an MSO managing them. They don't have, you know, they can't afford a management company or maybe a full-time CEO or whatever it is. So this is kind of like a variety of services that help take them to the next level, help offer them those services that they may need that they don't realize necessarily that they need or that they may save money on essentially. So how big an alliance is this? Is this your plan to kind of make this a, or is it already national or is that your plan? How big is it? So we have members across 13 different states. We have 40 founders at this particular point in time, and we're looking to add our next 100 mm -hmm. doctors across the country. So yes, national based organization and looking to grow very rapidly and across multiple specialties and also trying to offer a primary care based initiative as well. All right, so what are some of the things that you hear from doctors that they find to be the most challenging? Um, I know, you know, some of my practices are doing great. A lot of them have indicated that, um, you know, what they find frustrating is that people assume that in a private practice, you can't make as much money, uh, that it's too hard to stay independent. Um, and I don't know that or that the benefits can't be uh, comparable. You know, those are right. really you know, and I often talk with my doctors about how they can attract really, you know, great talent. How do they compete with the hospitals or the private equity owned companies? Is this something that you also talk about with your clients? Absolutely. Um, competitive wages is a big issue, especially now um, with COVID and just getting people to come back to work in certain states. Oregon's one that in particular has an issue with that. Um, Benefit packages, yeah, the, the cost of a health plan for a small provider is exorbitant. And so it's typical for 
a small business owner to actually try to share the cost with their employee, which they can't afford. And that might be a high deductible plan. And so we're also working on an insurance plan that is consolidated for our members that they can get at a better rate and working on other ways to design benefit packages for the practices that would again help, like you said, with competitiveness in the marketplace. And it could be different PTO packages. It could be some work from home arrangements on the, on the administrative side. It's, there's other ways to do it, um, but you have to be creative and open to it, but it also can't bottleneck your business. And so it depends on what type of practice that we're working with, but there's some other strategies that healthcare is starting to adopt that's helping them. Do you still find that once you're working with practices that they still end up you know, selling or merging, or are you really seeing that these practices, once they come on board, are able to successfully stay independent? I guess I'm still seeing a lot of sales going on, and I'm just yeah. curious as to whether those types of alliances, so to speak, can help kind of turn things around. I think that over time that we're going to, we had three of our members actually present deals to us that they had been presented to from different types of private equity firms. And, you know, we advise them to build a team and make sure that they are properly analyzing the opportunity, the economic, ethical, practical implications, cultural that's going on. Those three deals in particular, the doctors decided to walk away from, but, you know, locally and nationally, you're, there's even the last three weeks, there's been a lot of news around different cells by cells that are going on inside of, of private practice space. So it's, it's definitely on the uptick as far as the trend right now. It's, it is the trend to join a hospital based group or be bought out by private right. equity because of the cash that they're offering the practice. Yeah, we're I mean, we're definitely super busy with private equity deals right now. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's post COVID craziness or what it is, but there is definitely a lot going on. And obviously we work with so many uh, independent practices and many of them have been in business for a really long time. So we're really interested in helping them find solutions to stay independent if that's what they want. You know, exactly. a lot of times we may have doctors who are close to retirement. They don't have younger doctors in their practice to take over and it may be a perfect fit for them, you know, get the money, work for a couple more years and be done. And that's their goal. But mm -hmm. here we have um, practices that can stay alive and want to stay alive. You know, we're certainly looking to help them find options uh, to be able to do that. Um, so this is really kind of like an alternative route for physicians to consider. Um, is there anything else you think independent practices really need to know about their options that you know, other than just it's, it's possible, just get the right support and you can do it, which I think is kind of the only way that I know for sure. Right, right. I mean, I think they have to step back and consider what their goals are. You know, are they looking for an exit strategy? Um, why wouldn't they want to sell to another doctor instead of to a big firm, as an example? I mean, they started in a small practice as a possibility and have had enjoyed having that autonomy and creating that culture with their patients and their team. And patients like going to a private practice by and large and getting to know their doctor. We're by our nature is to be relational um, and have that connection. And that's hard to do in a big healthcare setting. It's easier inside of that practice. And so, you know, we, we do wanna present options for our doctors. We wanna make sure that they're educated about all of that that's in front of them. Um, but. We also want to make sure that they understand the goals and mission of that organization that they're they're joining, and it's not just margin improvement. It, there literally is mission and heart there, right? And I think you know, I always say this: like we talk about independent practices, but there are some practices that you know, being acquired by a hospital was just the right thing, and it was a perfect fit, and they're very happy. Same thing with private equity. For some people, it does work out really well. So I think another, I think measuring and considering if it's the right deal for you, what the terms are. Can you reacquire your practice if things don't work out? You know, what type of planning can we do? And the other thing that I always try and focus on is, um, you know, are, is it going to cost you more? So a lot of the formulas when you go to do those kind of deals talk about the idea that you're going to get X amount and maybe it's collection, maybe it's RVUs, but a lot of that is tied to the su success in collecting, right? So right. you have a practice that does a great job collecting and they then get acquired and they try and give themselves the same formula, but they don't collect as much with the new, with the buyer, then right. that 
that compensation package is not going to stay the same. The same thing if the buyer then tries to go and negotiate new payor contracts that aren't as favorable. So I think, you know, all these things you're talking about that the doctors control in their private practice, they give all that up That's when right. they go work for someone else. So I think you can do a deal with somebody, but you need to think about it if, if you know, about what it is to run your own practice and make sure that you're still thinking about those concerns when you sell. And then again, you know, if you're not happy being able to take that practice back. So I guess, you know, selling doesn't have to be the end of the road, right? right. It can be maybe a bump in the road if it doesn't work out. Um, have you had any practices that you have helped return to independence at all after um, I know you talked about that one that regretted it about 15 months later, but is that a trend you're seeing where people are undoing their deals? Well, the deals are hard to undo as, as you've probably seen. And so the, right. the few, the few that have approached us that have wanted out, they, there was no way out. So they have to write out the term of, of the agreement. Um, there it's more common for us not, um, to, because they can't, they don't feel like they can get out of the private equity deal or it costs too much money, let's say. Um, but from a hospital-based arrangement, we're running analysis and helping groups set up new practices and, and roll out of those type of agreements. Those are typically easier, I guess, I would say to, to transition out of. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to create it's, it's all about timing. So by the time, you know, we can grow and, and within certain markets, what, what our hopes are is that when these contracts with private equity firms, with the physicians and dentists that were unhappy with them, when they're ready to roll out, that we're, we're there to support and have that infrastructure to surround so that it's, it's scalable, it's, it's fun for them, um, it right. creates a, a good ecosystem that they can thrive and flourish in. Right. And, you know, there was a survey a few months ago, I think you and I may have spoken about this before, that showed a decrease in the number of independent practices out there. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think the survey was somewhat misleading. And I've said this before, because I think um, the doctors, I just don't think it fully reported all the independent doctors that are out there. But um, I also still see a lot of brand new practices that are starting up. So I, I feel like it was a little discouraging to see that survey because it kind of gave the impression that they're on the way out. But in fact, um, I, for, you know, everyone that we sell, we help start a new one. So Correct. I feel like we're, we're really seeing that. So I'm not really seeing the decrease that was shown in uh, that survey. I don't know what to believe. Are you seeing a lot of physicians starting brand new practices? Um, you know, maybe not right out of training, but um, just generally kind of taking a shot at it? Absolutely. I could point to, to several that I know. And, and some of those have resulted in they were part of a group. And some of the group rolled into a hospital-based type arrangement as an example. And a few of those doctors, maybe there's 10 15 decided, nope, I still want to be independent and autonomous and, and let's start this my, myself or ourselves, depending on the size. And so I've seen, I've seen more of that where it's fragmented out from a decision, a major decision that's been a roll up and then a roll out. Mm -hmm. um, younger doctors, that's where I'm a little uncertain about what that trend looks like right now, because it's, it's hard to, to catch that. That's a stat that you see a year or two later, as far as what, you know, our new doctors that are graduating from medical school, what are they doing? Um, I think they're being advised to basically shop around. There's a lot more options for a younger doctor than there was even five years ago right. um, because of how hot consolidation is right now. And there's more money um, in some of those deals for, for a younger doc, but the arrangements, you know, they change over time. And so they just need to be really careful about those opportunities. I think they really need to look at what type of doctor are they and what type of system is best for them. Are they academic based? So they need to be in an academic medical research center. Do they like the thought of the panache of being a business owner, um, depending on your feelings on that matter? Um, or do they want the collegiality of working with a group? And so I hope they don't get lost in just the transactional side of, you know, what does that business opportunity look like, but what's the right environment also for me and the patients that I want to treat and serve. Right. Yeah. And I work with a lot of residents and fellows coming out of training, and I think some of them will just consider any offer given to them. They don't necessarily have a preference. It could be geography. It could be they have loans to repay. Uh, oh. It could be going back to where their family's from. So there's a lot of different things that affect their decision-making. Um, you know, and then of course it comes down to money. 
And I always say to them, look, you know, when doctors come to me upset with their job, it's very rarely about the money. It's usually about the lifestyle. And I try to emphasize to them that, you know, life is short, obviously, and you want to be happy. Um, You want some say in your day-to-day life, how much you're traveling, what your schedule looks like, et cetera. I think sometimes young doctors are just so excited to get a job. They maybe they haven't started their families yet, or they're not really thinking about that. But, um, you know, the biggest complaint I get from doctors you know, that are in practice and unhappy with their job is about those lifestyle factors. So I really try and say to them, where, what is important to you? Do you want to start a family? Do you like having flexibility on your schedule? And there's always going to be those doctors where they say yes. And other ones like, no, I, 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 I work hard. I don't really care about that. I don't care how much I travel. I don't care. I just want as much money as possible. Well, there's a job for everyone out there. Right. And, but I do think that a lot of them, especially after COVID where we're thinking about, our lives and, you know, uh, being home with family, et cetera, really keen on, on rediscovering that. And maybe telemedicine will play a role in helping, um, you know, these independent practices grow even more where doctors can find a source of additional revenue and additional freedom. But I really do think we're going to start seeing some more independent practices. I know we just said we're seeing huge uptick in uh, private equity, but I still think there's a huge population of doctors out there where that independent practice is the right fit for them. And I, uh, I, I think, especially coming out of COVID, I, I'm definitely seeing that. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Um, all right. So I think we've kind of covered everything that we plan to cover. Do you have any final comments that you want to share? No, I just appreciate the conversation and dialogue. And I'm, I'm hoping that physicians realize that there are options for them and there are organizations out there that are trying to build resources that will help them enjoy private practice and continue to flourish. Great. Well, this has been really helpful. I hope you'll come back and tell us a little bit more about the trends that you're seeing. And if anybody uh, has any questions, they can definitely reach out to Kate directly. We'll have her contact information uh, when we post this and they can certainly find out more about her alliance as well as her company. And uh, we will share all of her contact information as well. So thanks for joining us. This has been the Health Law Hotspot and I'm Erica Adler and we hope to see you next time. You can find out more about us at ralaw.com. And you can check out all of our uh, previous podcasts uh, on YouTube um, by just Googling Help a Hotspot. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.